Well, good morning, everyone. And as you could see from last week, I may look a little different, and that's because I had a fight with my barber, <laughs> and he won. I usually tell people that I usually change my appearance from time to time because I, I'm in the witness protection program. There's a lot of people out there that don't like me uh, in the cults. There's a lot of Muslims who leave nasty messages on my YouTube channel, and so I always confuse them by either growing my beard long, cutting it short, or changing my appearance altogether. So this morning, we're going to be talking about Roman Catholicism. How many of you have Roman Catholic relatives? Roman Catholic relatives? How many of you came out of the Roman Catholic Church? Yeah. So my wife and I are both Roman, ex-Roman Catholics, and we came out of that tradition. I came from a very religious Portuguese home. Of course, over 95, 96% of Portuguese are Roman Catholics. And uh, I was born in a very religious family. Every Sunday we'd go to Mass, we'd pray the Rosary. Um, I had a great uncle who was a Roman Catholic priest. I have a second cousin who lives in Portugal today. He's now in his retirement, but he's also a Roman Catholic priest. And so I've been raised in that tradition, as has my wife. And praise God, I've seen my mother came to faith in Christ. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother, came to faith in Christ. And Vita's mom recently passed away. She came to know the Lord as well before she passed. And so God has been good. I want to talk about Roman Catholicism today. I want to talk about... Um, Roman Catholics, how we can reach them, but we need to know what they believe. So when we deal with Roman Catholicism, usually the two questions that arise is, is the Roman Catholic Church a true church with some false doctrines, or is it a false church with some true doctrines? And usually you will notice various evangelicals will vacillate between those two positions. Those who hold that the Roman Catholic Church is a true church with some false doctrine would take the, what I call the C.S. Lewis approach, the mere Christianity where we have all these commonalities, we believe in the creeds, we believe in the same fundamental doctrines, but we have these other, other doctrines that we don't really agree with, that don't really match with Scripture. The Reformers took the latter position that the Roman Catholic Church, they came to later take that position. Uh, originally, they held to the first one, but then as Rome became more and more aggressive against the Reformation, uh, they came to regard the Roman Catholic Church as a false church uh, because it had denied the gospel of grace. That's the dividing line as far as the Reformation goes. Is it preaching the gospel of grace? And so my position is the second one. I believe the Church of Rome is an apostate church. At one time, it did have the fullness of the gospel. After all, Paul wrote to the church in Rome. There were Christians in Rome already. After 20 years after the birth of Christianity, which shows you how rapidly Christianity spread. And so there was a faithful church in Rome. It was not founded by Peter, contrary to Roman Catholic claims. Uh, Paul never mentions Peter as the founder of that church. In fact, Paul didn't found the church in, in Rome. It could have been Priscilla or Aquila. So I take the second part, that the Roman church is a false church, and it has some true doctrines. It believes in the, in the creeds, but that's not our issue with them. So where does it start? The Roman Catholic church, as we know today, slowly developed. It, it's contrary to what Roman Catholics tell you, Roman Catholic apologists, the Roman Church doesn't go back to the apostles and Jesus founded the Roman Catholic Church and so forth. That is the claim they make. The Eastern Orthodox make that claim. The Coptic Church in Egypt makes that claim. It's all a, a, a rush to first place here by all these various uh, denominations. So around 500 years after Christ, you have this bishop of Rome by the name of Pope Leo uh, the, the I who declared himself to be Peter and the head of the Universal Church. He said, I am the successor of Peter. I am the head of the Universal Church. Um, many scholars, of course, believe the Roman Catholic Church, as we know it today, w comes into fruition around the 1100s, after the Crusades, the first crusade uh, being called uh, in the earlier part of the first millennium. And with the increasing power of the Pope or the Bishop of Rome, this is where you really begin to see Roman Catholicism as we know it today. Although the Roman Catholic Church today looks very different than what it did look, let's say, 200 years ago. If you've been following the news, Pope Frankie has been causing quite a stir, and he's saying things that uh, are very, very contrary to what former popes have said. And the center of the Roman Church, of course, is in Rome, Italy. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica, the Vatican. Vatican City is not Italian territory. It, is, it has diplomatic immunity. It is its own state. It has its own currency, its own bank. It has its own postage. If you mail something out of Vatican City, it'll say Vatican City on it, not Italy. And so that's where its center is. Now, to understand the emergence of this whole thing, you need to go back into history. And so the church is founded around 33 AD. Jesus dies in 33 AD. Pentecost marks the beginning of the church. 
in 33 AD. And shortly after the first century, you had this heresy arising, a very dangerous heresy called Gnosticism that denied that Jesus was a real man. It denied the God of the Old Testament. It taught that he was an evil God, that he was a demiurge, that he was this craftsman who brought the material world into existence and brought suffering and, and so forth. During that time, the Gnostics were claiming that they had bishops that traced their uh, succession to the apostles. And so what this did was it prompted the church to uh, take the office of the overseer, the episkopos, the bishop, and they created a separate office. Now, all elders are pastors, and all pastors are elders, and all elders are overseers. The Greek word is episkopos. It means a bishop. Where do we get the word episcopal from? What the church did in the second century was they created a third office by detaching the word overseer bishop into a separate office from the elder, which is not biblical. Paul left two offices to the church, elders and deacons. And so what ends up happening is they did this to defend the church against Gnosticism, and what happened was the bishop became the leader of a given city. So you have the bishop of Toronto, the bishop of Milton, the bishop of Burlington. These would be bishops who owned or ruled over various dioceses, that is, the community of churches. Well, there were five of them, the bishop of Jerusalem, the bishop of Antioch, the bishop of Alexandria, the bishop of Constantinople, the bishop of Rome, known as the Pentarchy. And these guys were the, the, were the bishops who led the church. Uh, until about the 500s when there was a big stir with the Bishop of Rome. All of them were equals. Not one was above the other. The, the Bishop of Rome was considered a primus inter alias, meaning he was first among equals, simply because of the prominence of Rome as the imperial city. But he was not greater or better than all the others. And so around 500 or so, the Bishop of Rome begins to claim supremacy over the other bishops. And this would eventually lead to a huge schism so in 1054, you have what's called the Great Schism. The Western Church and the Eastern Church break up. They split. They have a divorce. And what ends up happening is the Western Church tried to impose the papacy on the Eastern Church centered in Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul in Turkey. And the Eastern Church said, what are you talking about? We're all equals. We are all equals in Christ. And Bishop of Rome basically said, unless you accept my supremacy, my, 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 my supervision over the church as head of the church, then you are apostates. And so it was actually the Western Church that broke off from the Eastern Church. So I always kid around with my Roman Catholic friends, you're the, you're the original Protestants. You're the guys who broke off, uh, but for the wrong reasons. So what ends up happening is you have this, this huge geographical disparity where Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity. In Western Christianity, it's centralized in Rome. Eastern Christianity is centralized in Constantinople. But there's also linguistic differences, because in the West, Latin becomes the prominent language. And that is why you'll notice many of the reformers wrote their works in Latin, because Latin was the language of the church in the West. So much so that the West even had the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, which was the translation of the Bible, which God used to lead his church for at least a thousand years, until Erasmus would write the first edition of the Greek New Testament. And so we need to understand that there's a language disparity. In the East, Greek is the language of the church. So you've got Latin in the West, you've got Greek in the East, and that's why if you study theology or if you've gone to seminary, you'll notice all of theology is either Greek or Latin. All our terms are Greek or Latin. Even the word theology is Greek, the study of God. And, and so Latin and Greek become the language of theology, and that is why you, you just can't get away from from that. So I'm teaching a course on heresies right now at Toronto Baptist Seminary. So all these students are grappling with words like homoousios and homosia. And they're, they're, what, is that? what does that mean? What does communicatio idiomatum mean? I'm, I didn't sign up for a Latin class. I signed up for a theology class. Well, you're stuck with the languages because that's part of theology. So that's because of the history of the church. So some of the particular beliefs that Rome holds to. We agree on the creeds, but here are some of the particular beliefs they hold to. They believe the pope is infallible. That is, when the pope speaks in the office of Peter, they call it ex cathedra, meaning from the chair. When the pope speaks from the chair of Peter, he speaks infallibly on morals and dogmas. Doesn't mean he's always infallible, but only when he speaks ex cathedra. Scripture and sacred tradition are equal. The Roman church does not believe in sola scriptura. That's one of the biggest splits with, with Protestantism and Rome. We don't believe 
in tradition being equal to Scripture. They believe tradition and Scripture are equal. They also believe Mary is a mediatrix. Remember, tricks are for kids. Remember that? Okay. Uh, she's a mediatrix, and she's the queen of heaven, and she's mother of God. They believe in the Eucharist. During the, the Lord's Supper, they believe that the bread and the wine, or the juice, becomes literally, after consecration, it becomes truly and literally the body and blood of Christ. So that when you receive it, you are actually receiving Christ in his flesh and his divinity and so forth. That's why they will pray to the Eucharist. They will bow down in front of the Eucharist. When the Roman Catholic enters the church, you'll notice they always uh, genuflect. They'll bend on one knee and do the sign of the cross because there is a place in the church, in the altar, called the Blessed Sacrament. It's a tabernacle where they place consecrated hosts or bread. So they truly believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, in the, in the Mass. The Mass, they believe, is a continuous sacrifice. So every Mass, Christ is offering himself again. Not in a bloody way, they tell us, but he is offering himself. It's the same sacrifice as Calvary, and we've got problems with that. Um, the veneration of saints and images. So Roman Catholics will venerate. They'll say, we don't worship Mary or worship the saints. We venerate them. We give them due honor. And that includes the saints as well. And they believe in purgatory, that after death there is, a, there is this intermediate place where the souls go to. Um, they're not good enough for hell. I mean, good enough for heaven, and they're not bad enough for hell. And so purgatory, it's like brunch. It's neither breakfast nor lunch, but there's a cantaloupe at the end. Uh, and so in purgatory then, they believe that souls will go there to be purged. That's where we get the word purgatory. Purged from what's called venial sins. We'll discuss that in a minute. And what that means is you have to suffer there. It's a real place of suffering where it's, it, it cleanses you, it purges you of those sins. And you have to suffer what they call temporal punishments. So that's a very serious concern for, Rome, for evangelicals because it says that the sacrifice of Christ is not sufficient in and of itself, that you too have to participate in that suffering. And then, of course, the confession to priests, that if you go to the church, you can go confess to the priest, confess your sins, and the priest has the authority to absolve your sins and send you to do penance and make satisfaction, satispatio, it's called in Latin, to God. So uh, in terms of, sorry, going backwards there, um, in the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Evangelical Church, in the Roman Church, spirit, spirit, Scripture equals tradition. So the Roman Catholic will say something, you will say something, well, we're in the Bible is purgatory. They'll say, well, it's, it's, it's part of the sacred tradition of the church. And so we get that from sacred tradition. Uh, where's the view that Mary was assumed bodily into heaven? Well, again, that comes from the tradition of the church, which is equal to Scripture. They also accept the Apocrypha, which are additional seven books in the Old Testament that are not part of the Hebrew Bible. They're not part of the canon of the Bible but they accept these seven, like First and Second Maccabees, the Book of Judith, the Book of Wisdom, and so forth. Uh, and Protestants, of course, we align ourselves with the, the Jews because God gave them the oracles, and if the Jews don't know the Old Testament, nobody knows. And so the, the Reformers, not even the Reformers, you can go back to Jerome in the 5th century. Jerome was, was the guy who wrote the Latin Vulgate, and he didn't want the Apocrypha in there because he studied Hebrew. He went to Bethlehem and studied under the rabbis there. The only complaint he has was they charged too much to tutor. Um, but he went there and he learned Hebrew from them. And it's interesting, the church fathers that knew Hebrew all, all rejected the Apocrypha because they knew the canon. They knew the collection. Um, they call these other books, they don't call them Apocrypha, they refer to them as Deuterocanonical, meaning that they have a secondary status in terms of the canon. Protestant evangelicals believe that Scripture is over tradition. We have nothing against tradition. Because we Protestants have a lot of traditions too, you know, right? Mother's Day, Father's Day, and, and you know, should the pastor have a robe on or not? The church is split over these things. Um, should, should we use instruments in, in worship or no instruments? Uh, should we only use the Psalms in the Bible as opposed to hymns of grace and, and hymn book? There's a lot of these debates that go on. But Scripture must remain supreme. It is the Supreme Court. There is nothing higher than Scripture. And sola scriptura doesn't mean that we're against tradition. It means that as long as that tradition doesn't violate scripture, it's permissible. What goes against scripture must be rejected, as Jesus said in Mark 7, by your traditions you nullify the word of God. And so take, for example, the Lord's Supper. Jesus had no issue with tradition in that the Passover never called for the use of wine at the, at the Passover uh, Seder. There's no mention of taking wine or, or, or the fruit of the vine. 
you take the lamb, the, the bitter herbs, the unleavened bread. Nothing is said about the use of the cup. That develops within Judaism after the exile. They bring this into the Passover ceremony. And Jesus didn't reject it. He accepted it and used it. And so remember, as long as tradition doesn't violate scripture, we have no problem with that. There's a lot of misunderstanding about Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura doesn't mean me and my Bible under a cherry tree and we don't believe anything else unless it's in the Bible. I don't believe E equals MC squared is biblical because it's not in the Bible. Well, then you shouldn't be driving cars because they're not in the Bible. You shouldn't be flying by airplanes because they're not in the Bible. You should become Mennonites. And so the problem here is that it's a question of authority. We believe in sola scriptura. Roman Catholics believe in sola ecclesia, church alone. The church determines the canon. The church determines doctrine. And that's problematic because the church has erred Many times, as Luther said in his defense at the Diet of Worms, that the church has contradicted itself, popes have contradicted themselves, and I am bound by my conscience, and unless it is proved to me by scripture and by plain reason, I will not recant. Here I stand, so help me God. There's also a psychological, philosophical aspect here. In the Roman Catholic Church, the emphasis is on the visual. When you go into a Roman Catholic Church, what do you notice? You're like, whoa, look at the stained glass windows. You've got these paintings. There's these colors. You are, you are immediately attracted to these types of images. And so in the Roman Catholic Church, there's a visual aspect, right? That's why Roman Catholics pray to statues of Mary and the saints, and they have pictures of them in their cars. Um, and everything is about going to the Mass and seeing the priest raising the host. You look at that. You view that. That is the centerpiece of the Mass, Whereas in, in the Protestant Evangelical Church, the emphasis is not on the visual. The emphasis is on the audible. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so when you go to some of these evangelical churches, you know, let's, let's be honest, they look kind of blah, right? I mean, you know, it's pretty plain. There's nothing, you don't have these big paintings and, and colors and so forth. It's pretty, I mean, Zwingli would be happy with you guys, because Zwingli... Uh, stripped all the churches and made them as bare as possible. Uh, Luther, Luther didn't have some, you know, Luther was okay with these, you know, a crucifix, a crucifix and, and stained glass windows, and even, even Knox would have no problem with that. Some Presbyterian churches have beautiful stained glass windows and so forth. Um, but the point here is that the emphasis in the Reformation is not on the visual, it's in the hearing, the preaching of the word. And notice that the centerpiece in the Roman Catholic Church is the altar at the front of the church. The centerpiece in the in evangelical churches is the pulpit. Why? Because this is where you hear the word. This is where the word is proclaimed. And so the emphasis is on the audible, not on the visual. So let's talk a little bit about the papacy. The papacy is believed to be instituted by Christ, who appointed Peter as the first pope. So in Matthew 16, 15 to 18, when Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus says, you are Peter, and on this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of Hades will not uh, uh, advance or, or, or supersede against it. And they take that statement, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, they take that word rock to mean Peter, because the name Peter means a stone or a rock. And so they take that, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, they take that to mean on you, Peter. But for the first 300 years of the church's history, no church father accepted that interpretation. Augustine said, the rock upon which Christ builds his church is not Peter, it's the confession of Peter. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And even some fathers later who said it was Peter would say, it's Peter and every Christian that makes that confession. But Pope Leo is the guy who took that and said, that's me. The Bishop of Rome is the rightful successor of Peter. And this is the highest office in the church. The Pope is, rep is the representative of Christ on earth. One of his titles is Vicarius Christi, which Latin means the Vicar of Christ. The problem with that is that the word Vicarius means to be in the place of. And the Reformers caught on to this and said, the word Antichrist, the word anti means to be in the place of or to be against. And so by the Pope calling himself Vicar of Christ, Vicarius Christi, he was calling himself Antichrist. And so Luther said, by your own admission, you have admitted who you are. I denounce you as Antichrist. Because Antichrist means the one who comes claiming to be in the place of Christ, in the stead of Christ, but at the same time to be opposed to the true Christ. 
He's also the head of the visible church, which is blasphemy because there's only one head over the church. Um, the Puritans, of course, complained that King Henry VIII, when he left the Roman Catholic Church, uh, did the same thing. He simply got rid of the Pope and placed the monarch over the head of the Anglican Church. So to this day, the head, the visible head of the Church of England is, uh, is our king, King Charles III, His Majesty King Charles III, who we should be praying for, by the way. He is our head of state, and we are called to pray for kings and those in authority. Whether he's a believer or not, we pray for him and his conversion as well. And so the head of the Anglican Church is the British monarch. This would be King Charles III. Um, the Pope is infallible in matters of faith when he speaks ex cathedra. Ex cathedra means from the chair. You ever heard the word cathedral? A cathedral is the seat of the bishop. So in Toronto, St. Michael's Cathedral is the seat of the Bishop of Toronto. And so in, in your region here, whichever region you're part of, you will also have a cathedral that is the seat of the bishop if, for this area as well. The papacy is believed to be rooted in Scripture, which is the Roman Catholic claim. Now, what does the Roman Catholic Church say about the papacy? And so, folks, you know, like I said, I got a lot of folks who say a lot of nasty things about me online, and that's okay, because Jesus had that too. I'm in good company. Jesus said, woe unto you when men speak well of you, for this is how they treated the false prophets who came before you. So when people speak well of me, I get a little nervous because I'm not supposed to be getting those kind of things. I'm supposed to be receiving opposition. Apparently, that's what the Lord Jesus said. The only ones who got the accolades were the false prophets because the false prophets will tell you what you want to hear. They'll tell you God wants you to be rich all the time. God wants you to be well. You should never be sick. You could name it and claim it, or as I put it, blab it and grab it. And so that's a false prophet. A true prophet will tell you what you need to hear. You're a rebellious sinner, and you need to get right with God. Nobody likes that message. But that's why the prophets were all killed. They were persecuted. They killed the Lord Jesus Christ. They hung him between heaven and earth. John the Baptist couldn't please people by abstinence. They cut his head off. Jesus couldn't please them by participation, by eating with sinners and gluttons and prostitutes, and they hung him between heaven and earth. Do you think you're going to fear any better? You'll be hated by all men, he said, for my namesake. If the world hated you, don't be surprised. It hated me first. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And that's why if you're not persecuted for Christ, it's very simple. You're not saying anything. You're not identifying with him. You're not saying, I follow Jesus Christ. Because the moment you do that, it's, oh, you're a fanatic. Watch out for that guy. He's living in the dark ages. Oh, I'm a Muslim. Wonderful. You're so progressive and liberating. We respect diversity. You know, diversity is our strength. Christianity? Mm -mm. No, no homophobic, Islamophobic, and on and on it goes. You'll learn more about that when we deal with culture Marxism and how it's infiltrated our governments and why it's so much against Christianity. Here's the quotes of the Roman Church. 1302, Pope Boniface VIII, Unum Sanctum, the one holy church. Furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman Pontiff. The Roman Pontiff is the title of the Pope. You're not subject to the Roman Pontiff. You're in trouble. The Roman Church says you can't be saved unless you're subject to the Roman Pontiff. Pope Innocent III, who wasn't very innocent, all are, as all creatures in heaven and earth and under the earth must bend the knee before God, so must all obey his vicar, so there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So all of heaven and earth, under the earth, bows the knee before God, referring to Philippians 2, 9 to 11. The Pope says they must bow the knee to vicar of Christ. You must bow the knee to Christ's representative on the earth. That's why during the medieval period, kings would bow to the Pope. The Pope wielded incredible influence during the medieval period. And it's the popes that carved the boundaries of Europe. And it's also the Pope, by the way, who told the Spanish and Portuguese explorers, Spaniards, you guys go west, the Portuguese, because we're competing with each other, you guys go east, and that is why Central America and South America is primarily Spanish-speaking today, because of the papacy. Council of Florence. Now compare this to what the Roman Catholic Church teaches today. Council of Florence, 1442. It firmly believes the church professes and preaches that all those who are outside the Catholic Church, not only pagans but also Jews or heretics and schismatics, that's Protestants, 
cannot share in eternal life and will go into the everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels, unless they are joined to the Catholic Church before the end of their lives. That unity of the ecclesiastical body is of such importance that only those who abide in it do the Church's sacraments contribute to salvation. Notice that, contribute to salvation, and do fasts, almsgiving, and other works of piety and practices of the Christian militia produce eternal rewards, and that nobody can be saved no matter how much he has given away in alms, and even if he has shed his blood in the name of Christ, unless he has persevered in the bosom of the unity of the Catholic Church. In other words, you're outside the Roman Church, you're lost. Jews are lost, pagans are lost, schismatics are lost. Today, the Roman Church will say, you're all welcome. Since Vatican II, Protestants are separated. Brethren, you're invited to come back home to Mother Church. Uh, and of course, now the Pope is even saying, even atheists can go to heaven. Uh, because uh, they have what the Jesuits called invincible ignorance. They're so stupid they can't see the Roman church as the true church. And so God will permit uh, atheists into heaven. Remember the Pope uh, was asked by a little child. His, this little child came to the Pope and he was crying. And he said, my daddy, was a, he didn't believe in God, but he still had us baptized. Do you think he's in heaven? And the Pope said, absolutely. Your father did a good work by having you baptized. He showed that he had faith in something. So he assures this little child that uh, an atheistic person is able to go to heaven based on some good works. What does Hebrews 11 say? The one who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You're not saved by believing in the great void. You're saved by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. So who can interpret Scripture? The Catechism of the Catholic Church. The task of interpreting the Word of God authentically has been entrusted solely to the magisterium of the church, that is, to the Pope and to the bishops in communion with him. You can't interpret the Bible properly. You need the church to interpret it to you. Mother Church, which is the Pope and the bishops, the magisterium, are the only ones who can interpret the Scripture. That's why they didn't like the Reformers putting the Bible into the hands of the people, because the people don't have the right to interpret Scripture. Now you see why they, they killed Tyndale? why they chased down Wycliffe. They never got Wycliffe, but eventually they exhumed his body, burned his bones, and threw the ashes into the River Swift. That's history. That's documented history. Because he dared to take the Bible and translate it into the English language. And the same thing happened to Tyndale and many others, many others who suffered. And so the Bible is the most bloody book in the world. People shed their blood so that you could have that book in your hands. And today, we treat that book as what? A doorstopper? A bookend? Think about that. People shed their blood so you can have the opportunity to read in your own language. If it wasn't for them, you'd probably be reading the Bible in Latin still today. Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let us say up front here that we honor Mary, we love Mary, she's the blessed mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Protestants have no aversion to her. She was indeed, she said, all generations will call me blessed, and, and indeed she is blessed, she was blessed, chosen by God to be the mother of the Messiah. And so we have no aversion to Mary. We honor her as the mother of the Lord. But in the Roman Catholic Church, she's believed to be the closest human to the Holy Trinity. She's the mother of God. I don't have time to go into this now, but the, the word mother of God is not an unbiblical, or it's not something that conflicts with Scripture, because it is, it is in the Council of Ephesus, the Creed of Ephesus, and Chalcedon, which Protestants accept. And that title appears there, but there, it's there for a reason, to safeguard the deity of Christ. I don't have time to go into that, but... The Roman Catholic Church clearly elevated Mary to a point that is virtual idolatry. So she was conceived without sin. They believe Mary was sinless her whole life. She was conceived in the womb of her mother without the purge of uh, the stain of original sin. She functions as an intercessor between the faithful and God. You see this in the Ave Maria prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. She has the power to redeem people from purgatory. She's also the mother of believers. She is to be honored in prayer. For example, the rosary, which are these beads that Roman Catholics recite, the, the Hail Mary and, and the Lord's Prayer. And the Vatican has validated at least nine apparitions where they believe Mary appeared to various people. And among those are Fatima in Portugal, Lourdes in France, Guadalupe in Mexico, and La Salette in France, where they believe she really appeared, actually appeared. 
Pope Pius IX is an important pope in the history of the Roman Catholic Church because he defined the Immaculate Conception. He's the one who declared ex cathedra that it was declared in 1854, December 8, that Mary was immaculately conceived. Don't confuse the Immaculate Conception with the virgin birth of Christ. A lot of Christians think Immaculate Conception is the virgin birth. It's not. The Immaculate Conception means Mary was conceived in the womb of her mother without the stain of original sin. She didn't inherit the sin of her parents. She was sinless. And this contradicts, of course, Romans 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Luke 145, Mary says, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Right? Only sinners need saviors. If she wasn't a sinner, she wouldn't need a savior. The idea was rejected by leading figures in the early church's history. Irenaeus rejected it. Augustine rejected it. Thomas Aquinas rejected it. It's also rejected by the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and Protestants. So this is not a doctrine that was embraced by all Christians. In fact, its evolution came late in church history, much later in church history. It's not something you find in the New Testament. We know very little about Mary. All we know about her is from the Gospels. And the last time we hear about Mary is in the book of Acts, chapter 1, 114. She's in the upper room, and after that, she falls out of the pages of Scripture. All we know from church tradition is that John the Apostle took her as Jesus gave her to his care. And what we know is he took her to Asia Minor, to Ephesus, and there she passed. There are reports that she passed either in Ephesus or in Jerusalem. I think it was in Ephesus with John. Pope Pius XII is another important figure because he defines the assumption of Mary. Uh, this is the doctrine, the dogma that says that when Mary died, her body was assumed into heaven. That is to say, her body did not remain in the grave. That her son loved her so much that he desired to take her body into heaven, just as his body was resurrected and taken to heaven. And so the doctrine says that when they placed Mary in the tomb, when she had died, they went back to check on her bodily remains and her tomb was empty. In another account, Thomas, the doubter, comes to, he wasn't there when Mary died, and so Thomas comes to her grave and notices that her tomb, three days after her death, he notices that the tomb is empty. Sounds familiar, where have I heard that before? An empty tomb on the third day. Okay, um, and so the belief is in the Roman Catholic Church that the body of Mary was assumed, taken up to heaven by her son, and that she is queen of heaven, and that she sits at his right hand. Christ is at the right hand of the Father, Mary's at the right hand of her son. He declared that a dogma on August 15th, 1950, and that's why in the Roman Catholic Church today, August 15th is the Feast of the Assumption. And so that doctrine contradicts John 3.13. Jesus said, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended, which is Christ, the Son of Man. Our idea is that Mary was assumed into heaven. It appears very late, and it appears in apocryphal sources. It also appears that many of these sources were Gnostic. They were heretical. And even the Pope at that time told Christians that these were heretical doctrine. And the doctrine of Mary being assumed up into heaven, the Pope at that time said, was the teaching of the heretics. Isn't that interesting? The Pope at the time declared it as a teaching of the heretics. The Pope in 1950 says it's a teaching of the church. You see the contradictions? It's all over the history of the Roman church. And it's also rejected by the Orthodox. They reject this doctrine as well. So notice the comparison, folks. Christ is sinless. Mary is sinless. Christ had a virgin birth. Mary has immaculate conception. Christ is the mediator between God and men. Mary is the mediatrix between Christ and men. She intercedes between Christ and men. Christ ascended into heaven. Mary was assumed into heaven. Christ is king. Mary is queen. Christ is our Lord. Mary is our lady. That's how they, they refer to her as our lady. And in Greek, it's kuriake. It's the feminine form of kurios, the word Lord. It's the feminine form of the word Lord. Christ suffered... Mary suffered. When Pope Paul II came back in the 80s to Toronto, I went to hear him in Downsview Airport. Massive, massive, tons of people there. And I remember him preaching and telling us that at the foot of the cross, as Mary stood there with John, she suffered with Christ. She 
shared in the sufferings of Christ for the salvation of the world. Pope John Paul II was a complete Marian devotee. He loved Mary. In fact, in his, in his uh, the side of his robe, he had in Latin the words totus tuus, which means all yours, Mary. And when he was uh, attempted, the attempted assassinations on the Pope, if you remember when they almost killed him in St. Peter's Square by a Turkish uh, terrorist, a Muslim terrorist, um, they extracted that bullet from his body. He took that bullet to Lisbon, to Fatima, to the shrine of Our Lady of Fatima, and placed that bullet on the crown that is placed on the statue. And he went there to thank her, to credit her with saving his life. So he's a very devoted Marian uh, uh, follower. Christ is prayed to. We pray to the Lord Jesus. Mary is prayed to. She's addressed in prayer as well. The Mass, the central focus of the Roman Catholic worship is the Mass. The sacrifice of the Mass is the same sacrifice as that of Calvary. The only difference is that it's an unbloody sacrifice. Well, here's a problem. If it's an unbloody sacrifice, you can't have atonement. Because what does Hebrews 9.22 say? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So how can it be the same sacrifice when the, the sacrifice involved the shedding of blood? Um, it's offered repeatedly to confer grace on those who receive the Eucharist. This is important because, see, Hebrews tells us, the writer of Hebrews goes to great pains to tell us that Christ was sacrificed once for all, and that he was not to be his sacrifice was unlike the Old Testament sacrifice that had to be repeated. The fact that you have to repeat something tells you that it's not perfect. But because Christ's sacrifice was perfect, it was once for all and was accepted by God as a perfect sacrifice. And God showed his acceptance by raising him from the dead, by justifying him, by vindicating him, by raising him from the dead. God shows that he accepted his sacrifice as the Lamb of God. The Roman church teaches that that sacrifice is repeated every time in the Mass. But if it's repeated, then it can't be a perfect sacrifice. That's why you go to purgatory. So the Jesus of the Roman church is not a full savior. He's a partial savior. And that's why there is no assurance of salvation in Roman Catholicism. And the priest at the altar takes the place of Christ, and he's referred to as altar Christus. That's one of the titles of the priest. And the word altar Christus means another Christ. Because he stands in the place of Christ and makes the sacrifice. It contradicts the finished work of Christ on the cross. Jesus cried out, it is finished, in John 19, verse 30. He didn't say to be continued. He said it is consummated. The Greek word is tetelestai. It's a perfect tense verb, which means completed action in the past with ongoing results. The sacrifice, the work is done, it's finished, and the ongoing results is that it saves the people of God. It's efficacious to save the people of God. It contradicts text in Scripture that says that Christ's sacrifice was once for all. He offered himself once. The writer of Hebrews clearly shows his sacrificial work was perfect and therefore did not need repetition. And the Mass does not guarantee assurance of salvation. You can commit a mortal sin and be damned. So in the Roman church, if you commit a mortal sin, if you kill, murder, commit adultery, that mortal sin will remove all the grace that you received at baptism as an infant because they don't believe in imputation. God doesn't impute his righteousness to you they believe in what's called infusion. So when you are baptized as an infant, grace is infused into your soul. So it's like, a, a, think of it as a gas tank. So every time you do something bad, the, the, the level goes down. If you commit adultery, you lose all of it. So you've got to go back to the church, get penance, you need to be restored and so forth. And that mortal sin, if left unconfessed, will damn you to hell. So all that grace you received is lost. There's no salvation there. It's gone. But then there's venial sins, and venial sins are like, like lying and theft, lesser sins. And these venial sins can be purged in purgatory, which is temporary. We don't know how long, but it's temporary. So we talked about purgatory. This is the belief that there's an interim place between heaven and hell. They're not good enough to make it to heaven yet. They're not bad enough for hell. It's like a divine waiting room, both a lot of suffering. Venial sins have to be purged as people suffer temporal punishments for sins committed in their lives. And this concept is derived from the Apocrypha, from the second book of Maccabees. There's a story there where all these Jews fall in battle against their enemies, and then Judas Maccabeus has offerings made up for the dead, prayers for the dead. 
But here's the funny thing. In that story, these Jews commit a mortal sin. They're, they're wearing these amulets of a pagan god. And the Roman Catholic Church idolatry is a mortal sin. So what's the point of praying for the dead if they committed mortal sins that damn you to hell? So even the story itself contradicts the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory. The Bible says nothing about the idea of purgatory. The Bible says there's only two destinations, heaven or hell. So in the end, folks, there's two places. There's the smoking section and the non-smoking section. And so <laughs> there's no third place. There's no interim place, right? There's no cigar lounge. You're either in the smoking section or the non-smoking section. Jesus didn't teach purgatory. It's the point that a humans die once, and after that, there is judgment, not purgatory. Once you die, you enter into the hands of God, into judgment. There is no second chance. Christ has already purged us, right? Hebrews 1.3, Christ has purged the sins of his people after making purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Did you notice that? He purged our sins. He did it. And why did he sit down? Because the work is done. When you finish your job and you go home, what do you do? You sit down. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a drink. I'm tired. I, I'm going to have a nice nap. Now the priests are running around in the temple, right? Well, you have to. Did you notice in the temple, in the tabernacle, did you notice there's no chairs? They never took breaks. They were always one, running around, walking, killing the sheep, taking the organs out, putting them on the altar, burning them. Do this, light the, the, the menorah. Do this, do that. But this one, this priest, when he offered himself up and purged us from our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high because the work is done it's finished, it's perfect, tetelestai, paid in full. That's our Savior. Rome cannot give assurance of salvation. No Roman Catholic has assurance of salvation. Every time I ask them, are you saved? Do you know if you're going to go to heaven? Well, I hope so. Well, hoping so doesn't mean it's so. You have, there is no, no Roman Catholic I've ever met believes they're going to heaven. All of them believe they're going to purgatory. Only saints make it to heaven because they have this excessive surplus of grace. Salvation can be lost due to mortal sin. Rome promises sanctification and grace through the sacraments. Notice justification in the Roman church ha happens later. The Bible says justification happens first. You're declared righteous, and then there's sanctification, then there's glorification. The Roman church says you are, you are sanctified now, and then you're justified when God says, okay, you're clean enough, I accept you. That's where the reformers were dividing with Rome. It's the gospel that matters. How is a man justified before a holy God? The idea is that you must suffer and make satisfaction, and this shows that Christ's suffering was not enough to save. And then they have something called the indulgence. Indulgences. A lot of people think the indulgences were only in the time of Luther. No, it still goes on today. There are indulgences in the Roman Catholic Church today. It's in the catechism of the Catholic Church. It still goes on today. And this idea is based on the fact that when Jesus died, all he had to do was shed one drop of blood to save his people. But because he bled excessively, because he, he bled, bled copiously, there was this surplus of grace, of, of, of merit. And so the Roman church came up with the idea of the thesaurus meritorium, the treasure of merit. Now how can we take that merit and apply it to ourselves? Well, you need a key to open up the treasure box. Well, who has the key? The Pope. He opens it, and he confers those merits on you, and they're called indulgences. It still goes on today. So the Pope becomes essentially a savior. At the end of the day, folks, we need to realize the words of Paul in Galatians 1, 6 to 9. It's all about the gospel. Notice Paul says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that, there, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. The word distort there means to change, to pervert. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. The word accursed there, folks, means anathema in Greek. It's the strongest Greek word in the New Testament. It means to be under the divine curse of God. It means to be given over to destruction. That Hebrew concept in the Old Testament where cities were delivered to destruction. They are given over to destruction, as we see in the book of Joshua, for example. And so notice what Paul says. If you deny the gospel of grace, then the anathema of God comes, comes upon you. It even comes upon angels who deliver other gospels. The Mormon church, for example, was started by a so-called angelic revelation. 
And so Paul says that if anyone, if it's we, if we come back, that is the apostles, and we give you another gospel than the one you first received, Paul says, let us be anathema. He puts the curse on himself if he were to change the gospel. At the end of the day, folks, what matters is the gospel, not the creeds necessarily. The Judaizers that Paul is addressing here, the Judaizers believed Jesus was the Son of God. There's nothing to indicate the Judaizers denied that Jesus was the Messiah, the the divine Son of God, the resurrected Christ. What was the dividing line was that the Judaizers were adding to the gospel of grace and saying, yes, you can be saved by grace, but you need to be Jewish. You need to be circumcised. You need to keep Shabbat. You need to keep kosher. In other words, you need to become what Jesus was, a Jew, in order to be saved. Paul says, that is another gospel. That is anathema. So, Rome has another gospel. She doesn't believe in the gospel of grace alone. So when the Roman church says, we believe we are saved by grace, they're not lying. But you have to ask, do you mean by grace alone? They'll say no. Now you know why the solas are so important. Sola fide, faith alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Sola scriptura, scripture alone. Solus Christus, Christ alone. And what's the end? Soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. That's why the alones, the solas, are so important. Because it removes the church out of the way and says it's Christ alone, faith in him alone, by grace alone. So our Roman Catholic friends need the gospel. They need to hear the gospel. The gospel of God's grace.